So, the first half of today at least will be, we'll start out with kind of a broad conceptual overview. And then we'll talk about the nitty gritty of data analysis much. Um, but then we're going to transition into the hands-on modules, which will be all about how you process these kinds of data. And the data that you'll actually be playing with today in the hands-on part is actual exon capture data. None of the species that I'm talking about today, but a very related similar data structure. So you'll see it's exactly the kind of analyses that we're doing on the stuff I'll talk about today. So, you know, this is a, such an exciting time in, in genomics and in biology in general because of all the advances that have happened with next generation sequencing, it's opened up genome scale analysis to huge range of questions which traditionally weren't, certainly weren't genomic and often were even genetic level stuff. And this is kind of exemplified by this ambitious genome 10K project, um, which is the goal is to basically sequence one representative of every genus of vertebrates. And there's similar um, projects in insects and in plants as well, and they also all have catchy little names like this. But the goal here, as is stated here, this project will be feasible within a few years. This slide's a couple years old. It's feasible now. It's not funded yet for this particular project, but it's certainly feasible. Capturing the genetic diversity of vertebrate species would create an unprecedented resource for life sciences and for worldwide conservation. So the idea is these kinds of resources really will allow us to do all kinds of things. Um, however, for most species, we don't yet have full genomes, and it's still challenging to generate them. And I would imagine most of the people in this room probably work on non-model or at least non-reference species where you don't have genomic resources. So you're interested in figuring out how to use these genomic tools in species for which there, there is no established resource. Now, I, I believe Paul already showed this slide, I was told. So, you know, I don't have to go through it. Basically, DNA, uh, sequencing DNA is dirt cheap now. So, pennies per megabase we're at. Paul, was yours updated? No. Okay. So, this is, this is <laughs> last night at about 11. Up to date. Okay. So, it didn't actually change from Paul. This was maybe right here. So, what I want to talk to you about is genome partitioning in general, which is any approach that takes the genome and reduces it down into um, smaller subsets. And there's lots of ways to do this. You've heard a lot about RAD sequencing already, and this is probably the predominant approach that's used in conservation and ecological genetics. Um, I'll focus, because you've already heard about RAD, I'll focus on exon capture today, which is an alternative approach which has cost <laughs> benefits associated with it. And I'll give you two brief case studies um, that just illustrate the kinds of questions you can answer and how you can go about developing these tools in, in non-model species. Well, I won't go into the nitty-gritty of why the case studies for this time, but then we'll transition after this into actually playing around with these kinds of data. Okay, so the reason that we're interested in genome partitioning is because it's still challenging to deal with whole genome data. There are a lot of bioinformatic challenges of species without existing genomic resources. So, whole genome sequencing is still expensive for populations. And in species with really large genomes, it's still rather expensive to generate a single genome. And most of our questions are either informed, so our questions being ecology and evolution or conservation are informed by sampling multiple individuals, either a phylogeny or within population studies. De novo, uh, whole genome <coughs> assembly is difficult. It's getting easier, and this is changing quickly, and it's exciting, but it's still hard. Um, and whole genome data, this is the most important caveat. These, these are ephemeral caveats, but this is going to be true even when these go away, and that is that whole genome data is not necessary for many questions. So this idea, you start with genomic DNA, so this is showing an alumina, generating millions of short sequencing reads, high error rates, and hard to deal with. So one solution is to partition the genome into subsets through some kind of enrichment approach 
and then this offers an efficient and trackable solution, you then harness this throughput, this massive throughput, and generate high quality consensus um, for consensus sequences for subset of the And also, the nice thing about this is this kind of is doing what a lot of us were doing before genomics, the genomics resolution, and that is dealing with loci at some level, right? So you're dealing with things that a lot of existing analytical and conceptual frameworks are already built on, just at a much larger scale. So genome partitioning kind of falls into a couple different approaches. So starting with some um, DNA sample, you can partition the genome using general approaches, that is, taking some kind of general feature of the genome, either how it's transcribed or other anonymous features, such as um, restriction sites, and use that to pull out subsets of the genome. So in tra transcription, you're pulling out express regions, usually protein coding regions, um, but you don't really have a lot of selection about which regions you get. You get everything that's expressed in a cell. For anonymous regions, you're, you're generating a lot of anonymous markers, but you don't have any link to their function. Okay? So these have the benefit, these approaches have the benefit of not requiring a priori information. You can extract RNA, you can sequence RNA, um, and you can uh, extract anonymous parts of the genome. Targeted approaches, on the other hand, PCR being the most common one that you're familiar with, require some prior information, either primers or probe set, something to say, this is what I want to get, I'm going to go get it, but I have to know what I, what I want ahead of time. So it's targeted, and targeted capture is the, the main approach that I'm going to talk about with respect to this. So genome partitioning is all about systematically reducing the size of the sequenced genome without reducing complexity. And that, if you haven't messed around with generating genomic data, that might not mean a lot to you, but all of these approaches basically take a huge genome complement and try and get subsets of it. And, but the, the trick, the devil in the details, is making sure that when you do that, you, you maintain lots of copies of those subsets and get rid of everything else, right? That's, that's the trick. And if you, lo if you lose that complexity, you experience a lot of the problems in data analysis and allele dropout and all kinds of issues with biases and skews. So just kind of to give you a feel for this, approximately how many copies of human, of human genomes, so it's three gigabases, more or less, are one nanogram of genomic DNA. So all of our protocols start with some input, a bunch of DNA, right? What does it mean? What does one microgram of DNA mean? What does one nanogram of DNA mean? How many copies would be over in that? Any guesses? Wild guesses? <laughs> it's not something you necessarily have an a priori intuition on, right? Or are you just asleep? <laughs> right, either one. So in this case, about 300 haploid copies. So in just one nanogram of DNA, you have 300-fold coverage of a, a genome on average. Okay? And so a lot of protocols start with vast amounts of DNA, um, but the key is to, basically, whatever you start with, you want to maintain that complexity. If you don't, you'll see things like high duplication rates. I'm sure Paul or Mike talked about removing PCR duplicates in RAD sequencing, for example. And that's a situation where you started with a bunch of complexity and then you're trying to isolate your part or partition your genome and you lost it, but then you made a bunch more DNA through PCR amplification, right? The complexity is gone, you still have a lot of DNA, but it's basically the same thing repeated over and over again. So it's just important to keep in mind. Now when we talk about next generation sequencing or NGS broadly, genomics broadly, most of that work isn't in ecology and evolution. And when you think about how these different approaches are being used, broadly, I mean, whole genome sequencing, actually, this would be probably much larger outside of the scope. So really predominant approach now to generating genomic data, RNA-seq also <laughs> massively used. Capture is used a lot in just a couple of systems. So in human medical genetics, it's used a ton. And then really, you don't see RADs outside of the scope of ecology and evolution very much. 
Now, of course, you know, you flip this around to what we're dealing with, right? With most of our questions, in conservation and evolution, really RADs are the predominant approach, especially in systems where it's the first foray into genomic analysis. I like to call it the gateway marker. And get you going in a system, right? It's straightforward, it's um, simple, and for a lot of questions, it is the most powerful approach that you can use. So you've already heard a lot about RAD. I want to talk about capture, and capture and whole genome sequencing are both used um, far less. You see RNA sequence a bit um, in conservation and evolution as well. So they use quite a bit less. But they're particularly useful in certain kinds of circumstances. And one of these is when your sample is highly degraded or um, you know, really rare at some level. So, for example, in historic or ancient DNA, you have all of these problems that happen. So you have nice, beautiful, long strands of DNA. Time, temperature, humidity, oxygen exposure, all these things break down DNA. They make it short or fragmented. They, make, they degrade it, so they make it low um, quantity and quality. And then you get chemical modifications. So there's particular chemical modifications that happen that result in actual errors in sequence data. So all of these things are bad news, especially for PCR-based approaches. So when DNA gets very short, you often can't amplify it. And so if any of you have ever dealt with either non-invasive samples that are really degraded or historic samples, I mean, even to get a simple amplicon to work, it can be quite hard. Now, fortunately, next-generation sequencing technologies are kind of uniquely suited to deal with some of the challenges that you see associated with ancient DNA. So, issue presented by ancient DNA, fragmented DNA, it's short. Well, the first step to any next-generation sequencing protocol is to take beautifully long DNA and break it into small pieces, right? So you actually save a step here, you're going to have to do that with ancient DNA. Um, and then, so this is the kind of a generalized flow of next generation sequencing library preparation. <clears throat> this degraded low quantity of DNA, you can abort, you can take a small amount of DNA, and if you do it well, you can amplify it up and maintain the complexity but make a lot of it. Right? So you can immortalize a, a library. So it's a really powerful approach to maintain really um, rare samples or highly degraded samples. And then chemical modifications can be dealt with through really high coverage. And so it, it, there's still challenges, but you can deal with these through basically generating really high coverage and, and knowing what you're looking for. Now one limitation is that this is generally too, true of next generation sequencing, but approaches like RADseq um, and transcriptomic approaches, so RNA-seq, don't really work that well with highly degraded samples. RAD probably works okay with things that are partially degraded. I know people are pushing the envelope, but the inherent variance in that approach anyway just becomes worse when, when you're dealing with low sample quality. Um, obviously, you need, as if you work with RNA, you know that your ability to get transcriptomes out of, say, a museum sample is, is not a very bright prospect. But both targeted capture and whole genome sequencing are actually do really well with this. So if you have questions and problems that rely on these kinds of samples, these can be very powerful approaches. So target enrichment is predominantly done now through in-solution capture. And the idea is you start with genomic DNA, you can Take that and just break it into pieces, construct a library. And if you're interested in just a subset of the genome, so shown here in dark blue, you then hybridize this whole genome complement to a probe set which matches these targeted areas. The most common approach now is to have these probes be biotinylated so that you can just pull them out of solution with the magnet. So you're enriching, right? You target your background, and the idea is to wash away, if it works well, you wash away your background. You put, enrich for your target, you have a capture DNA, and then this is what you put on the machine. So you enrich, just like you would with RAD um, approaches, and doing an enrichment based on restriction sites, here you're using your specific probes. So the data, and the kind of data that you're going to play with today in, in Bryce's module, and some of 
uh, the work that Tiago is going to go through. Basically, it looks kind of like this. You have some region of the genome, this little genome browser shot. This is a, a anonymous gene. And you have exons, introns, shown here, this UTR. And then in this particular experiment, there was, um, shown here is where uh, probes were targeting this gene. So you can see on the exons, and the, or maybe spanning short introns. Now, in principle, you can target anything. It's called exon capture because people tend to capture exons. There's nothing special about that other than it being a little bit more conserved. But you can target and capture anything that's not highly repetitive. So when you capture these things in rich, when it works well, you then get sequence data. So every one of these little bars, so this is ridiculously over-sequenced. Oops. But <laughs> every one of these little bars is an individual sequencing read. And you can see you get massive coverage near the target. It falls off quickly. Nothing in the intervening bumps back up, falls off. You get a little bit of stuff off target. But then when it works well, it looks like this. Okay, so these are the kinds of data that you're going to play with today. Capture, um, in, this, in this case, uh, whole mouse exome capture, we just struck it down to about 55 genes out of the 20,000 that were captured in the experiment. Okay, so how do you do this? So this, this, is, this particular experiment was on a chimpanzee, so that's easy to chimpanzee genome. How do you do this in a system that you don't actually have a genome reference? So targeted, by definition, requires knowledge of the target, right? So we've thought about this quite a bit, and I think one of the papers that you received ahead of time was a review in molecular ecology just talking about the various ways um, that you approach this. And so one way to do it is to use a two-step approach. So you can utilize some general enrichment approach to recover genomic data in a limited sample to build a reference. So either RNA-seq or RAD-seq. Did Mike talk about rapture? So same, same kind of approach. You can, you can get this information ahead of time. Or you can do low-coverage shotgun sequencing. So it's hard to assemble a good genome. But it's really easy to assemble a bad one. And so if you just choose you know, low coverage sequencing, you can assemble and get chunks of the genome. So there's ways to do this that don't require a lot of money and effort. But of course, one limitation on capture is that you have to do this ahead of time. It requires an extra step and added cost. The other thing you can do increasingly is utilize the divergent, divergent reference. So as more resources become available, these approaches become more practical. And we know, just based on how hybridization works, the capture should be robust to evolutionary sequence divergence of 10% or greater, even. Um, because the probes are long, they'll bind to DNA, they'll pull it down. Exons tend to be conserved. So targeting exons, you can go quite a bit deeper. So capture spanning millions of years of divergence work with high to moderate success. So often, for example, you could probably capture any mammal based on existing mammal genome resources. That would be straightforward. Some things don't have close references, so you might want to use a different approach. So what I want to just talk about today is our two case studies that are very much ongoing in, in my lab, where we've used both these approaches, either transcriptome-based um, reference building or uh, <laughs> divergence reference to generate capture. And then I'm going to show you a couple of types of questions that we've applied these approaches to, what, what these, um, what capture can open up. So the first one, work on chipmunks, is a collaboration with <laughs> Craig Moritz and Rasmus Nielsen, and then um, KB, Dan Vanderpool, and Tyler Linderoff uh, all contributed as well. So this work was really motivated by the idea that you can use museum samples to kind of unlock information that, that really we haven't fully tapped for the moment, right? So we have these massive repositories of historic sampling anyway uh, over the last couple hundred years of biodiversity. So you have both what was present across the landscape at different time points, and then you have time series. One of the great sets of time series were generated by Joseph Grinnell, so one of the founder of the Museum of Vertebrate Zoology in Berkeley, and really one of the 
the great field biologists of the early 1900s. And so Grinnell took great field notes. He did all these massive transects across California and across the West. He collected birds and mammals and archived them in a museum. And, and he, he even, in his notes, he spoke to the potential to use these maybe you know, 100 years from now for other studies that you couldn't imagine at the time. So then, 100 years after this work, Craig and colleagues went back and resampled one of these um, classic transects in Yosemite, and basically they said, okay, here's everything that Grinnell documented being you know, in the, these particular places across this transect 100 years ago. If we go back, what do we find? And so this is the transect across the, up the Yosemite Valley, up over the Sierras, um, onto the east slope. Okay. And what they found in this paper that they published in Science a couple years ago was that there was a lot, it, it wasn't an easy, predictable thing, there was a lot of change. So you have plotted here uh, 28 species that they, um, they surveyed, and you have uh, historic ranges shown in the horizontal bars, present range in the vertical, and then they've colored in everywhere there was a, an expansion and a contraction in red and green. So take home is that there were winners and losers. Some things expanded, some things remained stable, some things contracted, but for high elevation species, they mostly lost ground. They mostly contracted. And there's more losers than winners in this plot. So, in particular, this one endemic species, Tamius alpinus, the alpine chipmunk, only occurs in this region, and it lost a massive chunk of its range just in this hundred year time span. <coughs> Other species of chipmunks remain largely stable in the system, so we'll talk about um, alpinus and this Tamius speciosus today. And so, in alpinus, you have this shift. Um, so, tree line, it occurs up to about just over tree line at um, 10,000 feet, and it historically occurred down, so everywhere in black is where there was sampling, and everywhere where there's orange is where the species was detected. You can see um, in 2008 there was a pretty large constri constriction, so these areas where the species was before, it just wasn't detected. So for Ecological evolutionary conservation genomics, the question would be, in the face of this severe range reduction, are there significant changes in the level and pattern of genetic variation? It's a very short time scale. Um, and potentially, are there genomic signatures or positive and or negative selection associated with this shrinking versus stable populations? So we not only have a single species here, we have a, a whole community of species. So in potentially, you could ask this question across all 20 of those species. We started out with two chipmunks, but first, okay, so when we started this project, there was no genomic resources with chipmunks. They were just a handful of um, genes that had been sequenced at that time. And so we used this approach to sequence a bunch of, use RNA-seq to sequence transcriptomes from multiple tissues, get that assembled, do a de novo assembly of that, because there, at this time, there was still pretty much in chipmunks, there's nothing close to chipmunks that that have a strong, um, a good assembly. So we did this, and then we annotated all these sequences, identified about 20,000, or about 15,000 genes or so, designed a capture, um, and then did an enrichment sequencing. Then you assemble the data de novo, okay, so no, there's no reference here. And then we basically iterated this and added genes, and so we did two rounds of this. We ended up with a capture platform that's in solution that targets about 9.3 million base pairs and about 8,000 genes. So if you're interested in the details of that, the nitty gritty of how you do all of this, we published it in a couple papers. Um, B et al. 2012, and then I believe the one, one of the ones I gave you to read, 2013, focused specifically on the data analysis part. Okay, so in this study, we surveyed about 300 individuals. Um, we had parallel transects in this, the stable species. There was modern and historic, um, about 50 per 
the two time points, so 50 collected by Grinnell and his team, and 50 resampled by Craig uh, 100 years later. And then the same thing for the declining species, but we had two parallel transects for alpinus. So historic and modern um, replicated, so about 300 total with some outgroups. Yeah. Yes? What is in the X set? This, I'm sorry, this was just the same. That was the same. Oh, the yeah, yeah, it's in meters. Yeah, sorry. This is just showing that it, it contracted here and here. This is the sampling, this is where the sample <coughs> blacks where it was detected. <coughs> Don't worry about the dark green or the light green. So we then did one population. So per population, six captures. So one capture for each of these. So the individual libraries are barcoded and pooled and captured on a single experiment. And then we sequenced each of these on a lane of sequencing. Um, so it was six lanes of Illumina sequencing, which when this was done, the throughput now, you could do less sequencing. So 300 individuals, 9 million, 10 million base pairs sequenced. Um, including historic and modern. And I pulled the data slides that actually show the performance in various ways, just to kind of condense the talk a little. But basically, it works beautifully. So you get 90% of reads map that we map, map to targeted exons. We recover 99, over 99% of the targets. So basically, get everything we went for, we, we get. Um, most of the reads that we sequence are going to these targeted regions. And the most exciting thing about the experiment was efficiency was as hot as high for historical samples. It's actually a little bit higher. Wow. So the historical samples work every bit as good as the modern samples, in some cases a little bit better. Um, there was very low variance across individuals. Not a single individual of the 303 dropped out. So, which if you've worked with historic samples, that's, that's something. Um, and then, so each individual was sequenced across the 9 million base pairs to uh, a median coverage of about 25x per individual. So high consensus coverage across all these regions. Yeah, so Jeff, that's a pretty big deal to have no individuals drop out. Yeah. Out of there. Um, do you recall if all of those individuals then they didn't drop out, if they all had all the most time with you know, some kind of Yeah, so... Um, our recovery rate for individual was up around, it was over 95%. Yeah, and, and it's not a random subset either, so the ones that tend to drop or tend to be lower coverage tend to be the same ones because, you know, probably something wrong with the probe. So it, it, I will say that this particular experiment um, <coughs> was probably on the high end of success. You do get dropout occasionally with, with capture. Um, usually that has to do with screw-ups in the library prep, which I guess that's where drop dropout usually happens in everything. So in this particular case, the, um, the person generating the data was, was pretty good. <laughs> and uh, the, the interesting, the low variance was, was really nice. So we'll talk more about structure on Friday, uh, but so these are just structure plots. You're probably familiar with them. This is showing the stable species, historic and modern, so each one of these is a sampling locality, and this is using this program structure to, to ask how many, how many genetic clusters there are in the data, how, many, um, how individuals can be assigned to different clusters, and you can iterate up over more. Um, K equals two means you're testing the model of two, and you can see here for the stable species, there's really no evidence for, for two clusters, basically, there's just one, K equals one, um, across all these samples, they're all pretty much stable, historic and modern look the same. In Alpinus, this is the declining species, two parallel um, transects, so in the southern Sierras, which isn't sampled as well, and then Yosemite, which is sampled a little bit, a little bit more thoroughly, similar number of individuals. You see, historically, there was very little evidence for population structure, but at least in this transect now, the best fitting models shows a lot of substructure. So, over what is probably, you know, maybe 50 or 60 generations for these guys, you have a lot of structure developing. There's a lot of evidence in here based on some simulation work we've done on decreased effective population size and increased genetic drift. Um, less so in the southern range with, albeit sparser sampling, it's a little bit harder to tell. There is structure, 
and that might have shifted a little bit, but for the most part, it looks a little bit more stable in southern Japan. So, you know, you, in principle, you could do this for anything that has a time series, right? In this particular case, we had this really strong time series, but for a lot of museum samples, you have these kinds of uh, data sets available. Another thing to look at is the potential to look at change in allele frequencies through time. And so this is a two-dimensional frequency spectrum. That's just meaning we're just plotting the frequency of SNPs in two related populations. So this is historic. This is the contemporary samples, and this is the frequency of SNPs. Okay? So down here you have things that are low frequency in both, moderate frequency in both, high frequency in both. Okay? And what this, if there's no drift, right, and sampling's perfect, you would expect this, everything to fall in a straight line, and most things fall in the line. But then as you see things that fall off the line, the scatter that you see is a function of um, error in sampling and genetic drift. And you, what you can see from this plot, hopefully, is that the stable species shows a lot less scatter, it's a lot more stable, it's just less drift, is what we'd infer. And then this other species shows a lot more scatter. Um, and then we begin to see these things that start to look like strong outliers. Okay? Now, because this is captured, we know these are genes. We can speculate about whether or not these might be under uh, targets of positive selection. In this particular case, so people have used this approach to identify strong outliers, clear loci that are under adaptive evolution. Um, in this particular case, these guys are, these genes, are intriguing, but they, I'm not going to talk about them because they, they're kind of borderline. Turns out this process of lots of genetic drift requires a lot of sophisticated population genetic modeling. So drift causes chaos with allele frequencies, right? So it's not, we're not yet entirely confident that these are significant outliers, but nonetheless, they identify potential candidates for uh, follow up studies. Okay, so the second case study I want to go through relatively quickly is work uh, that we've been doing on the evolution of seasonal crypsis in lagomorphs, so in snowshoe hares and other hares. And this species, so snowshoe hares are brown in the summer and they're white in the winter, and this transition from brown to white happens every fall, right? and then they molt back to brown in the spring. And this is evolved as um, a crypsis mechanism. And this is work that we've been doing with uh, several people, including Mafalda, who's here in the audience. Um, so collaborators in Portugal, Scott Mills, um, doing a lot of the field ecology, and then my graduate student, Matt Jones. And so what we've been looking at with this system is, so photopure is really fascinating as an ecological character and also as a character of conservation concern because um, this seasonal change is controlled largely by photo period. So how much daylight there is triggers these hormonal pathways that trigger these seasonal changes in reproduction and lots of behaviors, as well as molts into winter coats, and then back again in the spring. So because it's controlled by photo period, uh, so it's evolved several times, okay? So there's many different species of mammals that show uh, seasonal molts. Um, in my lab, we work on these guys and snowshoe hares, so these are dwarf hamsters. So it's a, neat, it's a neat system. Now, in the context of climate change, it's intriguing too because it's controlled by photo period, and photo period isn't changing at all. Um, but things like snow cover are changing really rapidly. Yeah. So in years where it's low, low snow cover, or mismatch on the onset of snow cover and the melt, you get these spikes of mismatch. And snowshoe hares are interesting because they don't seem to realize that they mismatch. So they basically appear to show no behavioral plasticity. So when they're mismatched, they don't, they don't go to areas that are snowy so that they match. They just tend to avoid snow when there's an option, which makes sense at some level, right? Um, there's no plasticity in the onset of the spring and fall molt. They pretty much start in the same week every year, regardless of snow cover, regardless of dramatically different snow regimes. And this is all based on radio collar data by Scott Mills tracking 
hundreds of hairs over the, through the seasons. No plasticity in the fall molt, so the fall molt progresses under pretty much uh, a reaction norm that it is constant across different field seasons. And then, yeah, there's no behavioral plasticity. So their, their predator response is to sit still until the very last minute and then just run like hell. Okay, that's what a snowshoe hare does. <coughs> and they will sit there when they think they're hidden and you can walk up to them very close and they just, you know, they don't <laughs> stand out. It's, yeah. <laughs> so things that can run faster than me eat them. And there's a huge fitness cost to mismatch. So Scott has shown that basically weekly survival probability decreases by 5% during the fall and spring seasons of mismatch, and it's a function of mismatch. So they basically get, get eaten um, at a pretty high rate when they mismatch. So there should be strong selection to maintain this, this character. Now if we back up a little bit, we think about the broader evolutionary context of the system, there's geographic variation in winter molts. Okay, not all populations turn white, so most snowshoe hare populations turn white in the winter, and when they turn is a function, it shows a clinal pattern, so it's a function of how much daylight and, and local snow cover. So there is some evidence for local adaptation along the large environmental cline. But then there are populations along the coast here that have lost or completely lost the ability to turn white, so they stay brown all year. And these are in areas where Snowfall is more ephemeral, and most of the precipitation <coughs> happens as rain. So there's two interesting genetic components here, if to change and when to change. And um, we're interested in both, but I'm just going to focus on some work we've done recently on if to change. And so this is all research led by Matt Jones in the lab. Okay, so if we expand out, take a phylogenetic approach, basically there's this deep boreal clade, everybody turns white, there's a Southern Rockies clade where um, all the hairs that we know of turn white. And then in the Pacific Northwest, localized just to the habitats where presumably it's adapted to remain brown, you have hairs that remain brown. And this appears to be, this loss of seasonal change appears to be derived. Um, now, if you look more closely, there's a, there's a large polymorphic zone. So everybody brown on the coast. This is the um, Cascade Range. And so as you go up and over the Cascade Range, you see this transition from, from brown to white, but you have this area where in the middle, in the middle of winter, with lots of snow, you can collect both brown and white hairs. Okay, so it's like a, it's a natural common garden. Now, genetic work that we've done shows that there's really not a lot of population structure that correlates with brown versus white. So this really is continuously distributed populations across these transects. There's a little bit of north to south structure, south to structure, but for the most part these are, appear to be this, this single trait that's maintained presumably by a balance between um, migration and selection. Now it's discrete, so you can look at museum samples and in the field, and hairs are either brown or white, so it looks like a simple genetic basis. A lot of coat color phenotypes don't look like this actually. So it implies a simple genetic basis. So what we wanted to do is take the next step and develop genomic resources in the system and to use this natural um, zone here as a basis to map the phenotype and dissect it genetically. So we don't have a snowshoe hair genome yet, but there is a rabbit genome that we published, I guess, last year. Um, and they're pretty, pretty closely related, maybe 12 to 18 million years, about 5% neutral sequence divergence. So what we decided to do is to use the hair genome, or the rabbit genome, to de design a snowshoe hair capture. And what we did was first take a single full exome, all genes that could be targeted, capture from rabbit, capture a single snowshoe hair, sequence that, and then this is just a plot of, basically a circular plot of the whole genome that we captured. So in this particular experiment, there's about 43 million base pairs. And this is mapped to rabbit chromosomes. Um, and then there's a big chunk of undefined because it's the, the rabbit genome is incomplete. And then shown here, in everything that's in blue, basically we cover about 100% of the target. Okay, as you see, there's some variation, especially in these undefined areas. But for the most part, we get all the, rab all the rabbit genes pulled out of the hair genome. Okay. 
we then assembled that and then designed a hair specific capture. Okay. So working with a hair specific exome capture with about 60 million base pairs coding and non, we then did a pilot experiment where we took um, 15 brown and 15 white samples from these two localities, so equal numbers in both, more or less. And then we captured them and sequenced them to about 15x coverage per hair. We can then go through each individual and every single SNP that we find and ask, does that SNP associate between the known phenotypes? Right? We can ask whether or not there's any association between the genotype and the phenotype. When we do that, this is the plot of log p-values for, um, for this association study test. And so we basically find, much to my surprise actually, two genes with a perfect association. So these are our associations on the order of um, 10 to the minus 6, 10 to the minus 7. So perfect association, everybody that's brown has one genotype, everybody that's white has another genotype, informs the dominance of the two phenotypes as well. This one actually, this is the genome-wide significance threshold. So this is a small, small sample for a genome-wide association study. So, you know, there, and there's a lot of tests. This is a conservative correction. This is still walkingly significant with the correction. This one isn't, but just because of missing data. So as we add in missing data, that association becomes perfect as well. So I'm not going to talk about what the genes are really cool. But um, this is very preliminary, and really this talk today isn't about the genes. It's about our ability to do this kind of work, right? Yeah. But Jeff, could it be that you just were lucky? Because when you made your capture array, you could have missed the ones that were actually, um, I mean, this is yeah. great, but it, it's quite possible that you could have missed them, right? Well, it's possible, but then not, because we got we went after all the genes. So but it's possible. What is that a yeah, so we targeted exons and UTRs. Vast majority of regulatory elements are cis in the mammalian genome. Vast majority of regulatory elements fall within 20 kb of exons. So that's one thing to keep in mind. It's a common assumption that if you go after exons, you're only after going after protein coding variants. The vast majority of regulatory variants will fall within a whole exon capture or in flanking or being in LD. These associations may, these, both of these SNPs that are, so, groups of SNPs that are associating here, actually, are actually all appear to be regulatory. There's not a single protein coding variant that associates with the phenotype. These are all in UTRs. And so, yeah, it's a great question. So we could, um, it actually sounds like a reviewer I've had. Oh, sorry. <laughs> no. no, it's a very common thing, right? So, but the nice thing about exon capture is it's targeted. It's going after only 2% of the genome, but it's the 2% that we generally care about and can interpret. Um, it's possible to have transacting factors that are a long way away from the genes. Th those are rare, but they could happen. I mean, you would have to do a follow-up where you sequence the whole genome. Probably. First guess. Yeah. Talk about the genes. <laughs> so, there's two low side. Is there a certain genotype you have to have both Yeah, really cool, actually. So brown, the derived state, brown, appears to be fully recessive at both of these genes, which is interesting for, you know, all being sieve and lots of, base, you know, evolutionary theory. It's an unusual genetic structure, and we don't find anybody that doesn't have that that complete and association. Recessive, both loci. Both loci. Yeah. Everybody that's brown is homozygous and recessive. Any idea where they are in the genome? Yeah, well, they're on chromosome four <laughs> and chromosome seven. Yeah. And so, okay, so one of them is a known coat color gene. I'm not being cheeky. No, I, no, I no. really, I really, <laughs> it, it is preliminary enough to where I don't want to okay. well, broadcast it. But, but this, so this, uh, this one is a known coat color gene. You could name a handful of known coat color genes and you, you would say the gene. And then, um, but this one, the strongest association actually is a developmental gene that is in a signaling pathway, not an a priori candidate. So we would have used a, a candidate gene approach it would have entirely failed in this study. It's only through whole exome that we got it. Um, we, 
Wild speculation is that this might actually be involved in controlling the mold. So, yeah. So the reason it would have failed is because a lot of the ones that were homozygous at the gene on the left would have stayed white because they weren't homozygous on the right. And the, the odd thing, right, right. So this architecture could have totally screwed us up, but this suggests a negative flyotropy. But we don't actually see, so we're getting into complex genetics of the trait, but you don't actually see, you would expect to see what Fred just said, that you wouldn't have a perfect association because if, you, if it's um, necessary to have both homozygous recessive genotypes, then you should have lots of individuals that are uh, white that have our homozygous recessive one of the lowest and not the other. We don't see that. So everybody that's white is either heterozygous or homozygous alternative allele. So it appears to be a simple dominant structure. Because we don't see that, we think that there's probably a good chance that there is um, some deleterious interaction that prevents you from seeing that gene type. That I, or so say, say that in which genes? Well, that, 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 that the not having both recessive copies, if you have one, must be deleterious. Right? There must be selection against that at some level. Or, or, yeah, there's no way we got that lucky. So there's got to be something like that. It's, it's unexpected, but it could have, the phenotype looks simple, and so I just assumed it was a single gene, but it ends up being two. And they appear to interact in a very specific way there. So we're in the process of um, dramatically increasing the sample size and also sequencing outside of the polymorphic zone because if indeed it's recessive um, and dominant, you should never see the dominant alleles you know, in the brown zone, for example. It depends on the architecture, but we should be able to get a much better sense of it when we sequence more broadly. But yeah. I'm wondering how the coordinates if you do that so you are say, say it again. I'm wondering how important it is that you're able to tell UTRs and you know, G to the region the genomes that it's still going to be Um well I think it's it's important but also if you have enough information to design and capture, then you can figure that out pretty easily. So it turns out, in certainly in mammals, exon structures are really strongly conserved, and you get UTR regions from RNA seq experiments. Right? So, so UTRs, a lot of the UTRs we actually put on this array actually came from RNA seq as well as the whole exon capture, because they weren't very well annotated in the rabbit genome, and we added a lot of UTR. So I think it's probably important, especially if you think it's a regulatory variant. And a lot of things are, certainly coat color, there would be a good reason. Seasonal coat color that's a induced phenotype, there would be a reason to suspect to be regulatory. Um, so I think it's probably a good idea. Uh, but if you're doing a mapping-based approach or something like that, you, we definitely see some LD, it's not a perfect association, but we see some LD between the UTR and, and the actual protein coding regions, right? And so a lot of regulatory elements are within 1 kb of the transcription start site. So if you know where the gene starts and you just pile 1 kb up from there, you can, if you can get that information, then you'll get a lot of, you'll get a lot of that. And you'll get some of it from the capture because you actually get flanking sequences as well. So it's not that horrible to design, to figure out that using kind of standard bioinformatic comparisons versus good reference genomes. Yeah. In the case of genomes, uh, how do you deal, how do you recognize potential contamination? For example, because you don't have a reference genome in this case. Potential contamination at which step? Yeah, I mean, this, in the, when you get in the genes, capture. Uh, how do you recognize potential contamination? Probably that's not a genome, but something else. Well, there's, yeah, so two kinds of contamination, like microbial, or yeah, other in the museum, uh, in the case of museum samples, yeah, yeah, or in sure. the case of, uh, you mentioned something else right. about the ancient DNA, right. so how do you deal with these? Right, so the, the nice thing about capture, so for example, if you did rad on those samples, and you just did a de novo assembly, and you got you did stacks or something, you, you would get an assembly, and if that contaminant was present in many of your samples, you might think it was um, actual 
genome. In the capture experiments, because we're starting with known sets of genes, then we can we actually and then we map back to those. We ignore all the sequence. The contaminant presumably doesn't map to the known and known <coughs> genes. We ignore that for the most part, and we only analyze what we went after, and we just try to make sure that what we went after is an, a non-target sequence. Right? Does that make yeah. sense? But if there's, for example, from uh, the other genome or uh, squirrels or other mammals from the same genes. Uh, oh, well, I mean, yeah. So you definitely never want to mess up your. Yeah. There's no molecular biology approach that can get around screwing up sample identity. <laughs> um, but there is not an issue with you mean things being stacked in the same drawer or anything else like. The amount of DNA that you actually pull out of the museum sample, even if it's a couple hundred years old, is usually much better than um, the air contaminant or whatever you might have in a museum context. Not true in ancient DNA. Ancient DNA, for example, in, you know, in the Neanderthal genome project, that was a huge issue, human contamination, because humans and Neanderthals are pretty much the same, as you can't distinguish it. In this case, we actually quantified the level of microbial contamination in the chipmunks, and it was very low. You do that by blasting against existing resources, and you can tell when things are look microbial. Contamination among other chipmunks, there's probably some ways you can get at it um, bioinformatically, so contamination messes with nuanced things of SNP calling that you can test, and I, you can talk about those if you're, if you're working on something specifically, you can talk about how you actually tell when you have multiple DNAs in a tube, and you thought it was just a single diploid genome. There's ways to tell. Um, others? Okay. So just in summary, this basically provides a quick and efficient met met method to collect genomic data in non-model species. It allows you to use both contemporary and historic samples with capture. That's probably one of its main advantages, um, or at least what I, on the areas that I covered. And then it can afford rapid insights into population genetic questions. And I think the allure for me for capture is we do RAD in my lab too and a lot of RNA-seq, but the, the allure for capture is that you're, you have this direct, you're testing hypotheses that are a little bit more specific than anonymous loci that are structured across the genome, right? So, you're, you can go into it testing a priori hypotheses. You can put whatever on the array you want. You can put it on sex link groups, non sex link groups, candidate genes, non candidate genes, all genes, whatever. You have control of the experiment, and that's a really good thing. And so, that, you know, when you get an association or whatever you're looking for, you're, you're already on track to interpret it and do the follow, follow up experiment. And so I guess I would like to come back to this, especially since everybody that wrote this paper is in the room. Um, you know, the exciting thing about next generation sequencing approaches and genome partitioning is that in conservation context, we can really begin to look at some of these things. So if you haven't seen this figure, somebody probably showed it yesterday. What was it showed yesterday? Every day. <laughs> it's been an every well, day. We all get paid when we show this. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so basically, you know the drill. There's all these things that we couldn't answer before that we can now begin, hopefully, gain insights to. And I, I like to think about as you know, the people in this room are the ones that are going to be doing all the important work over the next couple of decades, right? All the students, you're going to have to come up with the good ideas in the next round, right? So think about this process not as a means to an end for a single paper, but as building resources and building towards a broader series of tools that you can use to really get at some of these things and open your mind to some of the things that you just wouldn't have thought that you could do um, before based on previous tools. That's all I have. I'm going to turn it over to Bryce for the hands-on portion. Four questions. Yeah. I was wondering, what is the price of X? So the, the definite, the, the con of X on capture is it is more expensive um, than RAD. Everything's more expensive than RAD. Um, <laughs> So it, and it's not that expensive per experiment, but it requires an activation energy. So you have to, you have to buy, the way they design these things is in batches, because it's just the chemistry that they use to design the probes, and they can't really scale it down, or they don't scale it down, I don't know which is true. 
Um, and so you have to buy it in big batches. So like the big Exxon capture for the snowshoe hares, all jeans, that's a, that's a big capture, 60 million base pairs. That costs for about 15 capture experiments, that would cost about $8,000. And we can multiplex, we've done up to 30 individuals in a single experiment. Probably can do a lot more than that um, if, you, if you want. And then it's just the sequencing cost, which if it enriches well, you can sequence um, you know, 15 or 20 individuals on a lane of sequencing to fairly high coverage across 60 million base pairs. So the, the sequencing is, you figure it out about the same way. So the capture cost is on front of that. Um, Not a high seat platform. The high seat platform. Yes. The high, the higher, the better. Yeah. Along the line, you keep your cost down initially in big bones. What's the smallest target territory or number of big bones that the country companies will offer making a lane for, at least in the public? Yeah. So, uh, I mean, early on it was kind of small, but. Um, yeah, that you can't scale it down too far. There are ways to do targeted capture on small sets of loci. For example, you could take 10 or 100 PCR amplicons that you have, and you could biopenylate those and make your own probes. I mean, people do that all the time. And people have develop, developed these um, ultra-conserved element sets that target deeply conserved things for, say, 700 loci in the genome. So you can scale down to um, less than a megabase. And if you have an even smaller set, you can just use redundant tiling on the same set. And it just becomes more and more highly enriched relative to everything else. The, if, you, if you're not doing big stuff and you're doing small stuff, you, wanna use, you don't want to use Nimblegen or something like that. You want to use uh, one of these competitor companies that have kind of aftermarket companies like Microarray. And they work pretty well, not quite as well, they work pretty well. And there you can do different probe set numbers, and I think the smallest they do, let's make fact check me before I even guess it, <laughs> the audience, but I think it's like 10,000 probes. 20, was that? 20,000. 20,000 probes, yeah. I was close. Um, so you do like 20,000 probes, and that's a couple thousand dollars, you know? 2,400. Yeah. 2,400. So you can scale down to that, and, that, and then the sequencing is kind of the same. The smaller the probe set, it's probably obvious, but the smaller the probe set, the more individuals you can both multiplex probably with a capture and also sequence on a single lane. So the chipmunks, that was 50 individuals per lane. That's 10 million base pairs. 50 individuals per lane to high coverage. When we do something like a snowshoe hair, we're looking at more like 10 or 15 individuals a lane, but that's simply because we've increased the target size by sixfold. Right? And it, it pretty much is a linear relationship. Not quite linear. Other questions? So there's lots of other ways to use these kinds of targeted approaches um, and develop them. If you're interested, you know, I'm happy to talk with any of you throughout the day about you know, different things that we've done or thought about or you know, that I think would work if I haven't done it. All right, Bryce, you ready?